one of the interesting things that I think we are seeing kind of pan out a little bit is during the draft, neither you or I were very high on the idea of grabbing a wide receiver at pick nine. And that is what the Bears did. They drafted Roma Dunze. And, you know, a lot of people out there love that pick. I, I was a little put off by it at first. But seeing some of these wide receiver contracts recently, they are just ridiculous. Some of these numbers are getting so high for these wide receivers that I'm starting to look at the landscape and, and, and think, man, I, I don't know if I would sign one for that kind of money, period. Like, I don't know if I would do what the Vikings just did with Justin Jefferson. Um, with him being the best wide receiver, too. I just I don't know if I could feel good about allocating that type of cap room, that type of money towards that one player for that position, too. And if that's how it's going to be, then, man, I would be drafting wide receivers left and right, just replacing one after the next. Like, when DJ Moore's contract comes up now, um, depending on what he's going to want, which is probably going to be – Whatever the market is is given out, which is a lot, I don't know if I want to re-sign him necessarily for that kind of money. It might be easier to just sit there and just replace, 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 replace. Oh, I don't know if I'd want to sign Odunze in five years, depending on what this landscape looks like in five years. So, um, yeah, that's just kind of something interesting. I think it goes into a lot of what we say about every position and about money in the NFL in general, right? It's It's not our money. We never get personally offended by when people get paid. Um, it's just more about like allocation of resources and how a team is built and how it's going to be functioning afterwards. Um, I think the only positions that that much money ever makes sense is like those top three positions of need, right? Like cornerback, maybe I think even that one's a little bit too dependent on everyone else on the field. Defensive end is a good one. And then quarterback's always a good position to put your money into, but with a position like wide receiver, it's so dependent on too many variables to the point where, it's nice to have a good one and it's going to be a quarterback's best friend. And I understand why Minnesota did it for sure because of the way that they've kind of, I don't think they mistreat their players or their, uh, their team legends in any way, shape or form. I think Minnesota is really respectful, but right. They let Stefan Diggs walk away or they traded him away, got Justin Jefferson out of it. They let Adam Thielen leave, right. They didn't make him retire a Viking. So I think there's a little bit more of a, just kind of, Hey, let's keep our homegrown talent homegrown. I understand why they did it. Having young quarterback, right? Kirk Cousins leaving, uh, JJ McCarthy being there and all that. So it makes sense. Having said all that, I think anytime you put that much money into one position that has multiple positions, even in on the field at all, at all times, right? Like quarterback, you could almost justify $50 million because there's one quarterback playing at all times. But when you have the second highest contract ever given out and it's a wide receiver, there's three of them on the field at all times, right? So now your other two positions are going to be less players or lesser players. So I, I just feel like contracts like that end up biting you in the butt. They they take too much money on your cap hit every year. You can't allocate those resources to other players. How it affects the Bears is uh, I'm going to 100% eat my words on the Roma Dunze draft pick. If you have Caleb and you know Keenan Allen's about to get paid 22 to $25 million a year, I think at this point, having seen that money go this offseason, I think Keenan Allen's like a sure thing to walk away. I don't think the Bears can afford to keep him, even if they wanted to, even if he like balled out and they want to keep him here, unless he took a team-friendly contract. And then, like you said, with DJ Moore expiring in about two years, you got to keep this stable of wide receivers rotating for now while Caleb's on his rookie contract. So I'm, I definitely am going to eat my words on the draft pick, how it results. Uh, maybe Roma Dunze is a huge bust. Maybe he's an absolute stud. Who knows? In terms of how the draft pick was used, I think I'm, I'm definitely eating my words from pre-draft predictions and what I thought of uh, taking two offensive players in top nine. I think you got a good player, and I think you need to look for a deal and affordability at that position moving forward in this current market of the NFL. Yes, the cap's going to go up and all that good stuff, but Right now, wide receiver, I think when there's three of them on the field at all times, I think they got to be cheap. You got to you got to get them as cheap as possible or maybe pay for one, but the rest have to be cheap. So um, I think it was a good pick. Hopefully he's as good as advertised. And yeah, I, I'm definitely going to backpedal a little bit on the on the how I felt about the draft pick at the time. And I think I, I, I like it more as the offseason progresses. 
Okay, so, so I, I may agree with that last sentence. I, I think I like it more as the offseason progresses too, but I don't think I'm going to backpedal. Um, you know, I never claim that I know what the Bears are going to do. I, I just know what I would like them to do, and whatever they do is whatever they do. I mean, that's that they have a whole team full of people up there that are making decisions together. We're just two fans, right? So there's always that. But um, I'm still going to double down and say, listen, every single year, there is at least one player from the defensive side of the football that winds up being a stud. Okay. You had zero defensive players taken to like pick 16. So, so in my opinion, just from just a draft team building standpoint to trade back to pick 16 and have a pick of the litter at the whole defensive side of the football to me would, would still have been way worth it. Um, I'm just saying, I also, as the landscape now changes financially too. Maybe this is one of those things though, that Ryan Poles is just one step ahead. And, you know, I am starting to understand why this picks makes more sense than I thought it did, but no, but I mean, I still think I would have preferred the trade back. I don't know. I'm stubborn. And all the things that we have said leading up to the draft are still 100% accurate, right? You are banking completely on Caleb Williams being good and knowing how to use these guys in the right position. And right now, the same defensive problems are the same defensive problems. We're still talking about re-signing Yannick Ngakwe to a team-friendly deal and hoping that we have a second or third defensive end on the team. We're still talking about Jonathan Allen or, uh, you know, all these players that could yeah. potentially be traded for a second-round pick. This because is exactly what we said was going to happen. You're going to go into training camp praying to God that one of your defensive ends doesn't get hurt because you are so paper-thin. You are so razor-thin at that position – that right now, if your offense doesn't carry a little bit in week in year one of Caleb Williams' rookie year, you're going to be kind of in trouble because this defense is still a paper tiger. It's really, really good at the top, and then depth-wise, it's still not that good. It has It's still a step ahead of the offense, but that's the problem you get with Roma Dunze and Caleb Williams. You're depending on two rookies to carry your team for the remainder of the season. Maybe it's a long-term plan, maybe it's not. But I know for a fact, if you had like a stud defensive tackle or defensive end drafted with Caleb Williams, we'd be talking about a much more balanced team. We'd be talking about which of these rookies is going to do better. Are we going to have two rookies of the year? Are we going to have one on offense and one on defense? And this, eh, it would be a funny conversation, but all the things ring true still. However, I'm just kind of uh, reacting to the situation of the market as it stands right now. Right. And that's the whole point you're talking about, which is yeah. these wide receiver contracts are getting out of hand. And I'm, I'm, it makes sense more to take Roma Dunze. I still don't necessarily agree with it as my first choice. There is a plan laid out there. The Chiefs have shown you, and it's a, it's a thing of beauty. It really is. You go out there and you draft a guy that should have been drafted in the first round, but he was kicked out of school for this for. I mean, I, I don't even want to get it into exactly what, but winds up going to a Division two school, and you wind up drafting this kid in the fifth round, Tyreek Hill, wide receiver, right? So now after Tyreek Hill, after you utilize him and it's time to pay him, what do you do? You draft him away for two first-round picks. You let some other team pay him however much money he wants, and you go off and win a Super Bowl with Rashi Rice and Valdez Scantling. I just I look at some of these situations of like where – these wide receivers are getting paid this boatload of money or they're worth so much. Like how are the Raiders doing with Devonte Adams? Was that worth it? Was that, was that super fun to give up all that draft capital for that guy? It could easily very well wind up biting you in the ass because that position alone, I don't think in general can really be that impactful to carry it. Like you said, there's three of them out there at any given time. You know, And we've said this, we've said this a hundred times. It's so dependent on your quarterback that the point I was trying to make with John Jackson, the third being an unrestricted free agent, right? He's unrestricted free agent. He has great chemistry with Caleb Williams. I would almost, I would bet a good amount of money that he's going to make this roster just on the chemistry he already has established with Caleb Williams. And if you're talking about a guy who was drafted ninth overall, and they're both making the team as an undrafted free agent, just due to chemistry, that kind of just proves our point, right? It's so quarterback dependent. The Romo Dunze pick just kind of still makes sense for the team as it's structured. And it is 
it's doing all the right things publicly and media wise. It's still being very, very quarterback friendly by taking a top nine quarterback uh, receiver for a quarterback that you just drafted. I think it's still um, a really smart move for showing support for your team and how you're going to build for the future. But like you said, you know, Tyree kill got, got traded away. That's after Patrick Mahomes had established himself as a dynamite quarterback and kind of was ready to take control of the team. And Hey, I can do this with anybody. It's not just Tyreek. If, Caleb Williams was two years in and he had that reputation. I would say, yeah, for sure. Or at least the Roma Dunze pick would maybe frustrate me a little bit more. Um, As of now, I think it's a good way to set up your quarterback for success. And moving forward, if Caleb Williams is the guy and he makes everybody around him better, I wouldn't be surprised if the Bears never draft draft a a wide receiver in the first round again. You know, we've talked about, the value of a quarterback. I did kind of just decide to dive in and do some numbers on what the exact value of a quarterback to a team is, or what a team is willing to pay a quarterback, because essentially the amount of money you pay them is how much they're valued. Right? So what I did was I went back through the last 10 years, I took the top 10 quarterback contracts and I also took the total cap for that year. And I did the math and, and, you know, I have their yearly salary along with the percentage of the total cap that they take up. And I did that for 10 years in a row. So I wanted to kind of share that because it kind of it does paint a little picture on where the NFL is at and how much they, you know, you hear this all the time with these contracts like we're talking about now with wide receiver ones like the numbers are big. Well, the cap, the cap is also growing. But it's the percentage of the cap, you know what I mean, that you're taking up that makes something, you know, either consistent or not. So just looking at it in 2014 here, the total cap was 133 million, right? And Rogers took up 16.5% of that cap. And you see a good good chunk of guys in the 15%, a good chunk of guys in the 14%. And I got the average there, 14.6% in 2014. Um, and it's kind of it's kind of interesting to look at the top paid guy was getting paid 22 million. Now that nowadays that's that's a steal, right? Yeah. So can I say one thing really funny yeah. observing this list? Because I, I know who the uh, out of curiosity, do you know who the top three paid quarterbacks in the NFL are right now? The highest per year. Salary? I mean yeah, I have the slide ready. <laughs> oh, okay. This year right. it's Joe Burrow, it's Trevor Lawrence, and it's uh, uh, Jared Goff. Right. So this year, just by example, oh, right this, now, this upcoming year. See, I have the this past year, but okay. Right. No, for this upcoming season, and this list is interesting because Super Bowl, Super Bowl contender, multiple Super Bowl, Super Bowl winner, Super Bowl winner, Super Bowl winner. Super Bowl winner, Cutler never even sniffed it. Bradford never even sniffed it. So, so back it's pretty then, I think I think it's interesting because back then your top eight guys were either in the Super Bowl every year or competing for it very, very consistently. So yeah. Yeah, that, that is a good good group of quarterbacks right there. So yeah, yeah and for sure. so you're spending the money. The money wise. was being the I was gonna say the right? money was being spent, spent well. And and that's important to, to recognize as we kind of move forward here. Um, 2015, right? The owners were happy. The average went down. So the amount of money they wound up paying that position, the cap went up. The cap's now 143.28 million. And you have, you know, Breeze at the top, just like last year, 16.5%. This year, 16.6% goes to the top guy. So fairly consistent, you know, not as many guys in the 15% and 14%. It kind of does a little drop off, but, um, Still, you see some good names up there, just like you said. A lot of Super Bowl contenders or winners, top guys getting paid. I right? assume that's Alex Smith at the bottom. Ah, uh, yes, that is Alex Smith at the yeah. bottom. Correct. Yeah. And yeah, I was surprised to to really realize how much money Kaepernick did make while he was in the NFL. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't well, know why. Yeah, yeah, he did. So 2016 cap goes up again, 155.27 million. Average is at 13.8. And personally, throughout this whole thing, I kind of felt like that's really the sweet spot for the average between 13 and 14 percent or like 12 and 14 percent even. Um, mm-hmm. That's usually where that that 
number bounces around. And this is just the average of the top ten. You know, I'm sure if I dive, dove in and did all of the contracts, it would uh, it would be a little bit different. But I assume it would still kind of move somewhat the same. Um, so yeah, Eli was the top guy. Uh, you have Tony Romo up there. You have Kirk Cousins up there. Cam Newton up there. Um, so as we get closer to modern day, one thing I've noticed is usually these these annual salaries they're going to balloon at the beginning with you know uh when they get paid right so Eli probably just got paid here Roethlisberger just got repaid Matt Ryan got repaid these are guys that towards the end let's say the second end of their career these all were problematic contracts in a big way as we inch closer to modern day Okay, yeah, that's a very good point. Um, Eli became a, a dead weight to his team. Roethlisberger's inc- incredible amount of money became an incredibly heavy dead weight. Matt Ryan became dead weight. Joe Flacco was an absolute problem in terms of financially. Matthew Stafford was not necessarily a problem because he was good enough, but he right, still, and he, his, he actually was about to win one. So right, Matthew but his Stafford salary was there. still, generally speaking, a problem. His salary being that high was still a problem, and like you said, the average. Um, per year, that 12 to 14 spot, you see the top five, six guys, that list is growing of guys who were above average. And the, and those contracts become problematic. Right. And then you got two MVP seasons coming up from Rodgers. And look, he's all the way at the at the bottom. Which is where, mean? you know, uh, Patrick yeah, Mahomes is right now. So looking at next year, mm-hmm. 2017, the cap goes up to $167 million, The average... Dips down at 12.8. Yeah, you had Flacco making all that money. Look, Carson Palmer getting paid at the back end of his deal. Um, Kirk Cousins making a ton of money. Yeah, Matt Ryan. Ryan Tannehill gets up there. So uh, then in 2018, 177.2 million. Average shoots up a little bit to 14.3. And Jimmy Garoppolo. Took a thirty-seven million dollar cap hit that year. Yikes! Um, Carr is up there. Flacco's up there. Wait, Carl Jimmy Garoppolo did... on which team? I believe that was 49ers. Ah, right, right, right. I think I thought of Jimmy Garoppolo as a Raider. Yeah. Yeah, no, that was probably the year he got paid. Yep. So huge problem. Huge problem. Yep, and then Carr was a massive problem. Oh, yeah, exactly. Carr was up there too. So then, in tw- we move on to 2019, and cap goes up again, 188 million. And yeah, yeah, I mean, so these numbers are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Like you can see now, now we're paying the quarterback 30 million, but it's still 16.3 percent. It's still that same percentage we saw five years back, where that that amount of cap space is some teams out there willing to throw that at a quarterback right and 2020 cap goes up 198 million and you know Dak Prescott getting paid uh Jared Goff getting money but yeah like you still have and this is interesting this is the only time that Brady pops up on this list and it's his first year in Tampa the year he was told to go get his money essentially other than that, throughout this whole tenure thing, Brady never once financially crippled his team. Not once. You know, he was always not a top 10 paid quarterback, and he's doing just fine, right? So uh, the interesting thing is that Tannehill makes this list again, hmm. right? And then 2021, the cap actually goes down, and that's due to the COVID year, right? So then in 2022, Tannehill's the top paid guy. Mahomes is up there. Very well deservingly so. We got Kirk Cousins, Jared Goff, Aaron Rodgers, Carson Wentz. Um, got Lamar Jackson, Dak Prescott, Carr again, and Sam Darnold, right? And the average is 13.1%. And then, so these last two years here, I thought, are very interesting. So then in 2023, Mahomes is the top t- paid guy, $37 million. But look, it's still... 16 and a half percent of the total cap just like we started 
you know, in, in 2014, it's the same. So 37 million, sure. But since the total cap now is 224 million, um, this average actually went down a lot. Look, a lot of these guys are getting paid under 10%, which is something that wasn't really happening. But then in 2024, you have this, whoa, which is just, you know, so the cap went up, but like, look at that ridiculous cap hit for Watson, the ridiculous cap hit for Dak Prescott, two guys at the top that haven't proven anything, taking up that much percent of their team's money. Kyler Murray's up there. Daniel Jones is up there as a cap hit. So, one thing we said at the beginning was, well, this is very well managed money because the top eight of 10 guys are all either appearing in Super Bowls or have won a Super Bowl. Whereas in this list, you kind of look at it and out of the top five guys, you only have Stafford. That's one. Then you have, you know, Mahomes, Jackson, Allen, Burrow, Goff. And I mean, I guess I could understand all those, but it's like, but. Daniel Jones, Kyler Murray, Dak Prescott, and Deshaun Watson are, have robbed their teams, essentially. You know what I mean? And it's it's kind of crazy. So, yeah, when you see it drawn out as a graph, it just kind of spikes in this last year. So I'm actually really interested to do this next year and see kind of if that levels off at all or if these teams are just going to continue to spend that kind of money on – on these quarterbacks. And like I said, when looking at the value, when you're assessing that much cap to one player, you're really leaning on them. And then the guy like Deshaun Watson just goes off and gets hurt. Well, I mean, this is, this supports really what we always talk about though, right? Is It's not about what you're paying a guy. It's not our money. We don't care at all. It's about the construction of your roster. It's about allocated allocation of resources and how can you distribute that money to make your team better? Deshaun Watson and Dak Prescott on their own are not making their teams better. If anything, their, their team, their individual team is looking, how can we get rid of this guy's contract so that we can advantageously move on and right. Like move on past this player, get a new quarterback, but make it more advantageous towards team building. And I think the Browns are a great example. The Cowboys obviously with Jerry Jones and how he's doing business right now, not paying any of his players. CD lamb doesn't have a contract extension. Micah Parsons doesn't have a contract extension. Dak Prescott doesn't have one. So they're looking to move on how they're going to move on. Who knows? Maybe it's free agency. Maybe it's through a trade, but I think when you allocate so many resources towards one position, it never, never seems to pay off. Those, the lists that you provided, it never really, the top end guys rarely, I'm not going to say never, but I think they hardly paid off. And usually when you gave us the average per year, teams that had the player below the average were being more successful. So I think moving forward, that's like something good that the Bears need to pay attention to, not overpaying people. And I think that's what Ryan Poles has been doing, which is, I think, brilliant and a good way to keep your team relevant. Well, I mean, we looked at a guy like Roquan Smith. We right. said, you cannot do that. Like, I'm sorry. Well, let – you know, let the Ravens go pay him. That's fine. Because to allocate that amount of money towards one position, a linebacker, it's it really cripples you in other places. And you need the depth. It's hard to stay healthy. And you need to be able to pay the depth, you know. So um, fi financial allocation is huge. And I think a lot of people, you know, don't understand. It's like the second half of the game. It really is. I always imagine it kind of like a like – a, poker match right at, at any point you can go all in but guess what if you don't win you know you kind of you could bust out that's why even what the rams did several years ago with trading away all their draft picks and everything like that it's like wow you're you're pushing your chips all in and good for them they were able to win but if they didn't beat cincinnati in that super bowl oh man they would have maybe highly regretted a lot of those choices, you know? So yeah, they'd be in big trouble as a franchise. And that's why as a bears fan moving forward, I think this is, that's, this is why we are all so excited about the future of the franchise moving forward is that it's just being managed well more than anything else right now. So regardless of how you feel about each individual player or anything like that, um, it's being managed well. And I, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but 
when Trevor Lawrence got paid, all I could think was at the very least, Justin Fields with an extension would have been worth 40 to $45 million at the minimum. Oh, and yeah. If we're, being, yep. if we're being honest, 40 to $45 million per year. You're looking at a Daniel Jones deal. I think you have to, right? And so what you do know what costs $45 million? Montez Sweat and Jalen Johnson. Right. And so that's a fact. It's not a it's not an arguable fact. Montez yeah. Sweat is $22 million. Jalen Johnson's about 19 and a half. If you were paying $40 million next year to Justin Fields on a contract extension because you like the guy and he's a nice teammate, you're losing your two key defensive players. And if your team, if your quarterback isn't ready to take over by then and carry that team, I feel about Caleb Williams. I said, it's the smart, logical, business savvy move to make. Whether or not you like Justin Fields or you hate Caleb Williams, if you can objectively look at the situation and just money and how to manage a team and general managing and roster allocation, resource allocation, roster bu- building, it was the smartest move they could have done. They have the quarterback position locked down for five years at minimum at a team friendly salary. And they got two of their best defensive players re-signed for the same amount of time. It's, yeah. it's a no-brainer. Otherwise, you would have been stuck in a situation where now you passed up two first overall picks to keep Justin Fields. And if you think that he's not going to demand some kind of money and want to get paid, I mean, you literally passed up two first overall picks to keep me. Why wouldn't you pay me? It's it's that easy. And he, he would have all the leverage. You know, the Bears. Would what are you supposed really- to do? If- Do you see that video where – Polls calls Atlanta. I did. Is that not horrendous? Atlanta might be the worst run franchise in the NFL right now. I mean, that was, I, I was taken back. I was like, I'm thinking to myself, like, is this real? Is this AI? Like, is this fake? Because is Atlanta you can't saying be no that because they stupid, think that right. The Bears are going to take Michael Penix. You don't think Michael Penix will be available? He's going to fall one more spot. And you just you get, get a free a fourth, fourth round pick. Fourth round pick. No, we don't want your fourth. Like, you're trying to pull a fast one on us, huh? And what do we turn what into what a fourth is... round pick this year? Our yeah, right. superstar punter. Right, exactly. There you go. I mean, it, it's 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 a joke, but it's not. I think, if anything, you were asking me, you were asking me about minicamp stories, and I think the minicamp story that, honestly, without question, is standing out as, like, the most beneficial – Thing on this team right now is Tory Taylor. Any, I have not seen one non-impressive highlight from Tory Taylor yet. Keep talking about the way that the Bears are constructed in it and paper tiger defense and all that stuff. If your defense is starting at the four to ten yard line every single drive after a punt, I'm not as worried. I, I for the whole remainder of the season, it's punting is one of those crazy things where when it uh, when it's not talked about, it's because somebody's doing their job really well. But then when somebody's just better than the rest. I mean, if you have a Hall of Fame punter, it sounds so stupid what we're talking about right now, but if we're starting every defensive drive from the 4 to 10 yard line, like that's going to be a fun entertaining season to watch. We've brought this up in the past a little bit and the closer and closer we start inching towards you know, preseason and then the actual season, I'm kind of a little I don't know how to feel about Matt Eberflus. And I'm still like, like, I I like this version of Matt Eberflus a lot more than the last two years. Even when it comes to press conferences, he's much more forward spoken. He seems like he just got re signed or something. Like, he is confident that he is good to go here and he's pretty open about stuff. Whereas, even the last two years, he was a little bit more taken back when it came to talking to the media. And then the look has changed. But in the back of my head, I'm, I'm still kind of left thinking, like, but what? You know, are you really a good coach? Because I'm not sure yet. Yeah. I'm really not. Um, and you had both your offensive and defensive coordinator replaced last year, right? So you're, like, lucky to probably have your job. And if the Bears start slow or if you see fourth quarter collapses early on that wind up resulting in a loss, um, his head might be on the chopping block real quick. I don't know. I just feel like this is such a – like do or die moment for him right now. And, you know, it, the, the schedule came out and it's kind of interesting. No division games, the first eight games of the season. So even if you do, I guess, fuck it up a little bit early on, you might still be able to bounce back against the division towards the end of the season if you get it together. But that's kind of what they did last year. 
Yeah, know. two years I in just, a row of coaches getting fired uh, would be very rough to to see when you had an opportunity to kind of like mini reset the franchise with a quarterback and a new head coach and guys that get along and are a tag team duo for five years. At that point, you're really banking on Shane Waldron being head coach material, right? Promoting him to head coach and offensive coordinator and all that stuff. If you look at the last 10 years of Super Bowl winning head coaches and guys that either like were the winning head coach or took their team to a Super Bowl, the list is is very, very hard to find comparisons for Matt Eberflus. That's that's how I would put it. And I'm with you. I don't think the guy does anything exceptionally well. He's soft spoken. He's not a character. I don't know what his expertise is in. I guess it's defense because he once he took over the defense again, he you know, the defense did improve. But that was because he had to, right? We had a, a controversy with a head with a defensive coordinator that we still don't know anything about, right? Um, and how that ended. But you know, you look at the last like five, even let's say five years, it's Kyle Shanahan, it's Andy Reid, it's Nick Sirianni, Zach Taylor, Bruce Arians, Kyle Shanahan again, Sean McVay, Bill Belichick, Doug Peterson. I think the most recent quarter, uh, the most recent coach that you could bring a comparison to with. Uh, with Matt Eberflus is maybe somebody like Dan Quinn, right? Falcons lost to the pa- yeah. Patriots in 2017. Dan Quinn was just like a solid defensive 4-3 minded head coach. He was quiet. He was soft-spoken. His, his team just did their jobs and all that stuff. But for all the, you know, attention. And, and who, was the, get, who was the offensive coordinator of that team again? Oh, Kyle Shanahan. Oh, Kyle right? Shanahan. So, <laughs> right, exactly. Oh, so, look at that. So when you look at these teams and like, you know, you, you, put all the in, in, uh, pressure and focus on players, these coaches are just as as much of characters and as much of the the whole package and identity of the team as the players are, right? So when you look at that, I don't know. It's going to be a very rare thing for Matt Eberflus to overcome the odds and, uh, you know, take his team to a Super Bowl in the next two to three years with the way that he runs his team, right? Like I think Pete Carroll would be the closest other thing, but even then Pete Carroll was a character and, and, you know, not even, he was not soft-spoken. He was high energy and um, very matter of fact and all that stuff. So I don't know, I don't know what your comparison is for Matt Eberflus and how, what your example is for him to be successful moving forward based on history. Um, So he's got uh, nicknames. Fingers crossed. He's got nicknames. What are yeah, his he's got nicknames. He's got nicknames for guys. Did you not see that video? Oh, he's got nicknames for other guys. Yeah, that's his, yeah, that's his specialty. I think. Cool. <laughs> right. No, exactly. I'm not. Listen, I know why he kept his job. He kept his job because after that collapse against the Lions, I think we were on, and I told you, if I'm that defense, I don't play this hard for this team again. Mm-hmm because this is just pointless at this point, you know, Mm -hmm. and they did, they went out there and played real hard and and wound up being, you know, a very good solid defense towards the end of the season. And so they did exactly the opposite. So throughout all that, he did kind of hold it together and that is why he was able to keep his job. So, so that's the only good thing I know about Matt Eberflus is he kind of managed to somehow glue it together last yeah. year but other than that i mean there's not there's not much out there there's been some pretty poor mismanagement too like that broncos game if you kick a field goal when you had the opportunity to instead of going on and on fourth down then you know you might have tied the game you might have won that game so there's been stuff like that 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 has just been poorly mismanaged throughout the games i don't know if there's any complete bad time uh, like timeout management or anything but he, there's nothing really special so no certainly nothing special about it and and if anything it's it's more negatives than it is positive so you know in the nfl we don't really necessarily give coaches enough time to even get better at their jobs and that's an argument to be made right is a lot of the things that maddie refluce did poorly um maybe he gets better at but you know i think Worst case, best case scenario with Matt Eberflus, I think, God, I, I'm not going to throw out these names yet, but I'm saying as a hypothetical, best case scenario, you get Bill Belichick, you get Pete Carroll, right? Guys who aren't necessarily, you know, 
I don't know how to put it like the number. They're not defensive play callers necessarily. They're game managers. Maybe John Harbaugh would be a decent comparison, right? Guy who isn't necessarily, he's a team manager more than a, than a game manager in the moment. Um, But even then those guys were pretty good in the moment. In my mind for that type of coach to work out, you have to trust the guys under you to do their job very well. And the two guys under him were just replaced. (laughs) <laughs> for not and even and the defense for, coordinator right, so, was not given the full title of that job he's basically right. a, a supervisor and help in, in the assistant role to help matty refuse continue to do his defensive coordinator job but i mean I, I guess i feel better about you know washington and waldron than i did about yeah you know last year's coordinator but so the, the i think when you see teams run exceptionally well it's because they basically have two head coaches, one on each side of the ball. The last time we saw it in here, if you can remember, Matt Nagy, Vic Fangio. Right. Yeah. Right. So that can work. And even right now, you have like Steve Spagnolo and Andy Reid. Those are two head coaches. Like Steve right. Spagnolo has been with the Chiefs. He's been a head coach with the Giants. He's been a defensive right. coordinator with the Giants. Like that works. You, you got a guy on offense. He does his work. You got a guy on defense who does his job. Really, if you're leaving Matt Eberflus to be head coach, but mostly just basically be the defensive coach, you're hoping that Shane Waldron is essentially a head coach on offense. And that comes with its risks, right? Is that if Matt Eberflus looks like he's doing a bad job, that guy is always going to be looked at towards his, as his replacement or as his interim head coach, because you basically do have two head coaches when it works well, it works exceptionally well. But that's why even when we go back and look at it, a guy like Cliff Kingsbury, who, you know, potentially could have gotten another head coaching job, might have been the best match here, right? It's a guy who, yes, he's technically a threat to take Matt Eberflus's job. But if you just say, Cliff, it's your offense, it's your show, it's all on you, go. And then Matt will take care of the defense. I would be more comfortable moving into this season probably with that type of situation and scenario than what we have right now, which is Matt Eberflus, keep keep doing what you're doing. And we really need to hope that Shane Waldron is a legitimate offensive coordinator that can kind of do everything. He technically did do it in Seattle because Pete Carroll isn't necessarily an offensive head coach. So that's a positive sign. But to your point, I don't know what Matt Eberflus does exceptionally well. Hopefully it's running his defense exactly the way he did for the 16 games as or 17 games as he did last year at the end of last year or at the middle of last year and just keep keep that progression going keep it you know keep the ball rolling i don't know we're still yeah. we're still going to find out i guess maybe i am kind of not giving him enough credit for calling the defensive plays throughout the year last year i mean that's i mean he did yeah, do that but, you know what i mean yes, but no i mean like that 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 is a huge it takes a lot on your shoulders to do that, you know.